Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Really excited. Today we're going to be talking about what the Catholic Church is going to look like in 100 years. Yeah, we're going to look at changing demographics. We're going to look at changing society. We're going to look at laws. We're going to look at uh, the state of the priesthood, Catholic church buildings, and make predictions about what that's going to look like in the year 2120 to be a Catholic. So there's a lot to talk about. So let's hop in the time machine and blast off. Grateful to be here with you guys, Father Rich and Ryan. How you guys doing? I'm so excited about this. I love talking about the future. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty cool topic. I think looking at where we are right now and the trajectory of where we're going is pretty interesting stuff to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it could be scary. It could be hopeful. It just depends on uh, where you view society going. Well, right now I view society going from here. From you Catholic Studios, and it's pretty awesome being here. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there man. you go. Now, I do have one thing that I know that should be in most people's futures. Why don't you tell that? Well, in the future of where you're going to be, you're going to be on the enters of webs, <laughs> and you're going to be visiting us at catholictalkshow.com, connecting with us and following us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as I see you as a patron. Very, very soon, going to patreon.com forward slash the Catholic Talk Show and being able to support us so that the show continue to grow. I see this show as a huge, huge show yeah. in the future. We're yeah. going to be really old then I know during it. the show. It's going to be fun. Kind of hovering in on these like hover wheelchair things. <laughs> wearing two ties at once. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go for my cryogenic therapy. <laughs> Cool, we could have Ted Williams' head on as a guest. <laughs> and Walt Disney. It'll be great. Oh, is Walt Disney cryogenically safe right yeah, now? I think so. That's oh, what wow. I've always heard. Yeah. All right. Well, it's pretty weird. Yeah. So, but I think a lot of generations have done this, and we're not approaching this episode as like prophecy or mm -hmm. predictions. We're really, I think, we're going to take a look at what the church will look like in 100 years based on what we can see where the world is now and extrapolating that out into the future. And where the church is right now, I would say, is strong as it's ever been and also more tenuous than it's ever been. And that's always been the, the state of the church throughout history. It's always straddles that line between as strong as it can possibly be because it has the protection of the Holy Spirit and as tenuous as it could possibly be because it has um, us as its body. Sin. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Where does the church go in 100 years? Now, I think where I wanted to start with this episode is with Pope Benedict, right? Pope Benedict, when he was still Joseph Ratzinger back in 1969, he did a thing called um, what the church will look like in the year 2000. And he made some predictions as to what he thought, um, you know, what the church would look like in the year 2000 when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger. And he wrote that he predicted that there was going to be a smaller pure church. He predicted that with the societal change of the 60s and 70s that more and more people would leave the church and it would be less of less cultural Catholics and less people who are Catholic because that was the societal norm and more of a church of active, willful participation and membership. And in 1969, Pope Benedict, then Joseph Ratzinger wrote, from the crisis of today, the church of tomorrow will emerge, a church that has lost much. She will become small and will have to start afresh, more or less, from the beginning. She will no longer be able to inhabit many of the edifices she built in prosperity. As the number of her adherents diminish, so it will lose many of her social privileges. In contrast to an earlier age, it will be seen much more as a voluntary society entered only by free decision. As a small society, it will make a much bigger demand on the initiative of her individual members. Undoubtedly, it will discover new forms of ministry and will ordain to the priesthood those approved Christians who pursue some per confession. In many smaller congregations or in self-contained social groups, pastoral care will normally be provided in this, fa in this fashion. So he's really saying, look, the things that we all take for granted, that the church has big, huge buildings and bishops, when they say something that's in the news and bishops get invited to black tie dinners and... Um, 
you know, you could just expect, well, though these guys are an Irish or an Italian family, so they're just going to be Catholic. That's that's going away. Mm-hmm. And the cultural I, I agree- phenomenon of the Catholic Church right. in a lot of ways is is built with obviously the church buildings, and and we're just talking about, I, I think, largely our experience in the church in America. And all of that can well, be throughout the world. Too. All of that can world. be summarized in <laughs> social prosperity and mm-hmm. political prosperity. I think from Constantine until present day, you know, realities even in our own country, we could see the prosperity of nations adopting, you know, Judeo-Christian morality as well as a respect and reverence for God. You know, but I think in most recent history, especially with where we are currently right now, we grew up in in that generation where it's like you're born, you're baptized, and you're you're at the christening. And from that kind of Italian New York tradition, I mean, it, it's it's that it, it's that aspect of how this has socially been a part of our generation, and and what is the legacy of our faith look like in our family? But currently, with you know secularism really taking a prominent forward stance. In relationship to pop culture, our kids are not growing up with that same sensibility, and it's not celebrated in the same manner. Maybe in different pockets, but with you know this kind of the push for the millennials, and also you know you know Christian church or Catholic church or the Christian experience or evangelical gatherings is really it's like okay that's your option that's what you that's what you do, but you know in this kind of relativistic society that's one option of many that I could commit myself to and I think that creates a foundation of what we're going to be looking at into the future as it relates to what is the church in 100 years what is the church in 50 or 60 years yeah. you know the fastest growing uh religious group in America are, are nuns mm-hmm. and not you know sweet little ladies with habits it's people who say I don't have a religion. Now, I, I read some statistics that 95% of nuns actually, or non adherents to a specific religion, believe in some sort of divinity, or even God specifically, or even Christianity. They, just, they don't have a religion. And one of the second, I think maybe the second grow, fastest growing uh, demographic is former Catholics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that that's pretty startling, pretty shocking, pretty terrifying. But I think when you look at it, people, we live in a society now that has the psychological, um, financial, and spiritual benefit of not having a religion. Because a lot of the questions that the church has traditionally answered throughout throughout her history, well, what do we do about suffering? What do we do about intense societal poverty? What do we do about injustice and oppression? A lot of those things are getting taken care of and have, I mean, there's still massive amounts of injustice, but nowhere near what they've been historically. So what context does the church really have to provide ministry when a lot of the things that she has traditionally solved are kind of off the table? Where is she now? The need for education, the need for health care, the need for right. art and, and inspiration and music and architecture, all of that stuff was done by the church. Astronomy, every respective endeavor academically was also championed by the church for centuries. And we've talked about that in previous right. episodes as well. And it is important to realize, like, I think healthcare is a perfect example. How many St. Vincent's do you go into or St. Luke's? Yeah, but those are Saint, all getting bought up St. Jude's. Exactly. They're all being bought up and they have pictures on the walls when the nuns were providing healthcare, when the priests were providing healthcare. And now it's it's a perfect example of what you're saying. I it's think. been privatized in yeah, a lot of ways. Uh, I think before the 1950s, churches were run by organizations and, and even schools too. Like you look at Catholic schools and how expensive they are. But but you also but because the nuns aren't there and because the the, the financial part of it uh, was worked out through the charity of religious institutions, and now it just can't simply can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes for hospitals and and for schools. But, you know, like when I, you know, you talk about the 60s and 70s. And when I when I was in the seminary uh, years ago, oh, gosh, that was a long time ago. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of ministries, right? There wasn't a lot of lay people like, you know, moving out like Exodus 90, these other organizations mm-hmm. that we work with at Fuzadi, our marketing agency. And we, we specifically work with Catholic organizations. So in the last 10 years, we've seen this like this surgence of like, organizations who are lay people saying, Hey, I, I want to bring Christ to other people and in, in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're seeing all these now 
organizations, and, and we go back to what uh, Benedict uh, Ratzinger was saying, is, is that it's, it's a smaller church, um, but there's a fertile soil of all these people out there who are nuns, who are not atheistic, they're agnostic. Why are they agnostic? They're not even agnostic. They just don't want to be involved in an organized, in an organized religion. religion. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, I mean, they don't know of the Christ of the church, right, in the in the religion. Right? And I that, think that I think that seed that we're now seeing fruits from yeah. in relationship to lay movements and organizations, I think it comes from that divine mercy message to St. Faustina. And in relationship to how that movement really took root throughout the world, it was because of faithful lay men and women who championed that message and passed it on, especially during World War II. I mean, how consoling that message of mercy was to that culture in, in the time of war all throughout Europe and the United States. It really was, that was the catalyst. And this was well before her canonization, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it, it's lay, lay movement is absolutely an important facet to consider when we're thinking of the church in a hundred years and, and where it's yeah, going. And I think that's what Benedict was saying is like, look, a lot of these services are going to have to be provided by the laity. And you see that, but like you said, by groups like Exodus 90 and groups like Paradisus Day and Stewardship Mission of Faith. These are groups that are out there on the initiative of lay people providing services and ministry that traditionally had been provided by priests. And in my mind, that makes me think of what uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen said. And he, he said, who is going to save our church? It's not the bishop. It's not our priest. Sorry. And it's not the religious. It is up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes, and the ears to save the church. Your mission is to see that the priests act like priests, your bishops act like bishops, and your religious act like religious. So that he's really saying, look, the church is not just the hierarchy. The hierarchy provides the sacramental structure of the church. But in the future, I really do think the laity are going to have to do more things. Now, is that good or bad? Now, because I see a lot of times when the laity, particularly like on parish councils, um, I see that a lot of times having a negative or an adverse effect on the on the uh, culture of a parish community. In what way? Um, overstepping their bounds, um, being just as entrenched and being just as dogmatic in a particular thing. And it kind of becomes a, um, more of a democratic process of the leadership of a church than, than, it, than I think it should be. It, it could be. And it, that's but, not but let me, that's... let me comment, let me comment on the, my goodness, like 10 or 12, yeah pastoral councils or parish councils that I've, I've been associated with in each of those parish councils, it's always been consultative in nature. Mm-hmm. And even my current parish council, you know, at the parish of John Paul II that I'm at currently is definitely consultative. And, and it's been so informing and, and inspiring to really work yeah, and with parish them. councils are great. There's awesome people doing awesome work, mm-hmm. giving so much of themselves. But uh, I've, I've just seen a lot of times where, they the power of that because either the priest is ambivalent mm-hmm. or the pastor is ambivalent or there becomes politics in it that those parish laity councils mm-hmm. can get a little bit sideways. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to have to maybe in the future see a more defined uh, teaching and, and rubrics and structures around mm-hmm. what the role of a parish mm-hmm. council is. And the USCCB has provided that, but I, I agree that it needs to be explicated more clearly and and really driven into these local communities because we, we were just discussing a video that was produced by the Bishop of the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee, and looking forward in his diocese, he's expressing to the people, hey, we may not have the luxury of having a priest in every single parish, and we need to be prepared for that. Now, how do we, how do we cover that pastoral need? Do we ordain deacons, permanent deacons, to be able to cover, cover pastoral need for particular parishes, and then the priesthood looks like a more nomadic reality. That's what I personally long for. I I love being a nomadic spiritual person where I am a priest and I'm moving about to different communities and ministering to them, much like St. Paul. But even the early church, the apostolic foundations of our faith, was exactly that nature. And I think and that's that was what, a necessity of the time. And I think we're moving towards a time back where that to that same necessity. There. And Pope yeah. Benedict is really underscoring that in relationship to what he sees and, and where we're going. So that's a very, very yeah, interesting that, point. I, I agree. That is one thing that I see is definitely the increased need for more deacons. And that's relatively new in the history of the church is the role of the, the permanent deacon 
Uh, it was in the early church, but for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that was not a prominent thing. But I, I really see where having a a deacon at a church to be able to provide baptisms and 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 provide a ordained um, competent authority when you don't you're not going to have a priest. I mean, even in my own diocese, there's a lot of parishes where it's yeah. the priest has to has he's in charge of three parishes. You know? I went to a communion service in Telluride. I was there vacationing, skiing, and I went to the parish and uh, the deacon uh, was out because of a marriage or something like that, that he was presiding over attending or something like that. And, um, and they, they gave very specific notes for the laity to provide a communion service. Mm -hmm. And, and I was like, man, can we do this? And then mm -hmm. I started thinking to myself, like, how many parishes are like this? Mm -hmm. You know, that, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the laity can, can, can give to the parish to keep them going, can, can have a community there with the people, um, but, but don't have that, that sort of, um, the, the, the holy orders aren't, aren't there necessarily see, then, in some particular cases. And, and I see the need for that and even the use for that. But it, part of that scares me is because then you start getting, um, national churches or churches that are run their own way and, and you lose some of that central cohesion but under at the, the authority at the same of, time though shield like that's that's happened even yeah. in the hands of priests, priests. or bishops right. so right. like right. It's, you're talking about it's a human, human, yeah, I think it's a human would, issue I think, I think if you have those types of arrangements that might accelerate the process of having that's that's that, a good that, critique i think it's a valid yeah. critique and again i see the need for it to happen mm -hmm. but just again having strict rules in place and, to and i think that's what it comes it. down to and and this is this even relates to conversations that i've had with a number of different priests and bishops over the years in relationship to the permanent diaconate being able to increase so they can do they can right now they can celebrate a funeral you know, they can celebrate baptism, but being able to extend the faculties of the anointing of the sick makes so much sense currently right now. Like yeah. we need to be able to give them the faculties. The bishop should consider giving faculties of the administration of mm -hmm. the sacrament of the sick. And then even potentially uh, looking at other types of ways that deacons, permanent deacons can provide these types of uh, faculties that are associated with just the priest. But thinking about the ritual book as is right now, the celebration of communion in the absence of a priest is a ritual it's a book. It's, it's an actual ritual. Right. And there's real strong prescriptions of how this should be celebrated. How does that, but how does that actual praxis get governed? How is there a... <sighs> How does the CDF make sh this make sure that that's actually people are being retained? Because you don't have you don't have eyes and ears on the ground anymore. Mm -hmm. How do you make mm -hmm. sure that that cohesiveness is maintained? I, I believe it has to be driven in education and catechesis. So, and that is the pastors. That is the pastors' priority. So, a pastor who is governing and administering over three, four, five, sixteen different parishes needs to be able to have a setup of how this is going to be communicated and how this is going to be executed by way of the church's teaching and how this should be covered. Now, I, I think that that brings up something. So uh, I think coming up pretty soon, uh, the, all the bishops are going to be, the bishops of the of South America are going to be having that synod on the Amazon. And one of the things they're discussing is that in the Amazon, I mean, this is an enormous area and there's not enough priests to cover it. And lots of piranhas too. There is. That's another thing in the future. <laughs> How are we dealing get, with that? Right. Issues. So one of the things that they that's on the table and that I think Pope Francis once specifically discussed in dealing with ministering to this amazingly huge area with bad infrastructure, not enough priests, is um, married priests. And they call them uh, viri probati, right? Men who have proven themselves, older men who have proven themselves to be stable men who are then ordained to the priesthood, even though they're married. Mm -hmm. And I think that this um, synod on the Amazon is essentially the opening salvo to win a hundred years. <coughs> I don't know if the church is going to avoid in the Western church being able to avoid having more married priests. Now mm -hmm. we already have married priests. We've talked about that before we've had them on the show, but I don't think the church is going to be able logistically to avoid having married priests to be able to administer as, as, in as much as that it needs to. And you never know. Right. I mean, like there's a resurgence of vocations and, and consecrated men and women in religious orders right now. That's 
I haven't seen in, you know, the right. 15 years I've been Catholic. See, that's, the, that's very true. But the population is booming so fast that it's, it's not commensurate with the rise in priests. So sure. Okay. This year we ordained 10 men where in the past we've ordained two men, but population is growing so fast that it's, it's growing, uh, and, in in a way that you would have to ordain hundreds of priests to keep up the population growth. So I have to say that, you know, when it comes to married priests and th that reality of, of the need. So even in the church early on, there were married priests, you know, the apostles are held up to be, we've, we've had an episode about this. Yep. And, but the point that I want to make as it relates to how we can cover the needs of the people of God, if we're talking about permanent deacons receiving faculties to minister you know, it's already there in structure. Low and, hanging fruit. Yeah, it's low right. hanging fruit. So just you follow the needs of the people that you serve. Yeah, we may be a small, smaller population, but it's the bishops, it's the Holy Father, and it's the priests on the ground, the people in the trenches that have to begin communicating that if we want this mission to continue to endure as Christ has commissioned us to be able to proclaim the good news and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have to meet that missionary curve of what is the need of the people. So I think mm -hmm. this, this synod that's coming up is going to cover that need. I think looking at the possibilities of having married clergy, which is already happening in the ordinariate and things like that, it's, it's presenting a need. And for me as a celibate man, it doesn't change the reality of the charism of my celibate priesthood mm -hmm. at whatsoever. You're, it, not, you're not like, oh, shucks, man, I can have a wife now. Yeah. Now, if you did that like maybe 10 years ago, I, I, it would, I would be in a different place. Right. So I think, I think you're it, old now. All that's I, out of your bones. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. But like, it's just like, you know, for me, living celibate priesthood is so powerful because it's an invitation. It's a choice. And it's, it's not even a choice. It's an invitation by Christ to live this way. So even in the gospel passage where it says it's a gift, and if you have received this gift, right. to, so, to so choose and make the choice to respond to that invitation of Christ to live out in that manner what celibacy is. There's yeah. consecrated men and women who are not even priests, right. not mm -hmm. even nuns. Consecrated virgins. They consecrated themselves to God. I mean, I've met at least a half dozen of them, you know, and I'm like, that's beautiful. She's like the, one of the girls is like, God called me to this, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? And, and think of how that inspired you. I could tell yeah. as you're, as you're sharing that, that touched your heart. Yeah. And, and that is the generation. And that's the generativity of what our evangelization looks like as a mystical body moving forward with the same mission right. yeah, that's so, been entrusted to us. Uh, I, so yeah, in a hundred years, I think there will be more deacons and they will have a more active role in administering to the mm -hmm. people. Uh, another thing that I see um, in a hundred years is that there's, and I think we already see that there's going to be less churches. There's just going to be less structures. Um, you see, I mean, every parish and every uh, diocese around the country, they've closed multiple churches because, you know, during the early 1900s, you had a lot of different uh, nationalities moving to America. And then you had your Italian church and your Polish church and your German church and your Slovenian church and your Irish church and every, every Every nationality had their own church, and they were all in downtown. Like, when, Ryan, you come and visit me in Cleveland, there's that one, like, city square. There's, there's, like, 15 churches, 15 Catholic churches within a two-mile radius. Mm -hmm. We don't need that anymore. Right. And so those churches being closed, I mean, it's sad because they're beautiful, but they're not necessary anymore. And with the advances in public transportation and mobility of people, dude, you don't need to walk to church anymore. You have a car. You can go there, right? So having less churches, I think, will also alleviate the need for having as many priests because you'll have a more centralized location. So maybe you'll have bigger churches, but less of them. So instead of having 10 parishes of a thousand people, you'll have one parish of, you know, 10,000, right? Mm -hmm. I could see that being in a hundred years where the church goes with how they manage their actual properties. But that just breaks my heart thinking of the church becoming something like that, because in these mega churches, where you have tens of thousands of people affiliated with one location, what suffers is the intimacy of the grouping of mm -hmm. Jesus in the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount of like grouping them in 50 or grouping them in, in smaller, you know, kind of tribal type of experiences, because it's, it's that communal aspect that we have as church. That is that Hebrew word kahal, that gathering of the faithful people that we receive 
together and we share with one another the perspectives that we draw from Holy Mother's instruction in Eucharist and in Word. So that reality in and of itself is much more attractive to me if it moves back to that mission of the, the domestic church where the priest would come into the homes of different communities and being able to celebrate the sacred liturgies in these different communities, in these in these larger spaces that could house 50 to 100 people or 150 people. Yeah, but then you get into the problem with not having enough priests to do that. I just think that it's just... The reality of it is that we don't need as many churches. So in a hundred years, there's going to be less Catholic churches. That's mm-hmm. I have no doubt. There's already that's, that's already, already trending. So I mean, right. they've already shut down a bunch of churches. But in it is, as it's related to Cleveland, New York, yeah. Chicago, all these different Bigger national cities, churches, right. those are closing. But you look at you look at my diocese. Right. I, I'm currently in a brand new mission. Yeah. Now, how do we build this mission? Do we do we build like a massive church that's ten, fifteen million dollars, twenty million dollars to build a massive church? Why would we why would we pour our stewardship into that space, in my opinion? Like, why spend that kind of money where you can move churches now? We were just right. talking about this last night. You you can ultimately deconstruct these churches from the northeast, stone by stone, and then you transport them and build them in another location. That's cool. It's great that we're in a, a wonderful place, one, architecturally right. to be able right. to accomplish that, but two. It's financially advantageous. You're it's not. Prudent. It's prudent, and you're actually managing the stewardship of the people of God to the end of maintaining what has been tradition and a place where you know worshipers have gathered in the Sacred. Catholic tradition for you know yeah. decades, if not centuries, in these beautiful church buildings, and then maintaining that you know, and really maintaining that heritage. I think that is something that we should look into and then investing more in an infrastructure of the digital interface of the church Absolutely. and proclaiming the gospel through those modes, something that we're trying to do in relationship to Fusati, you Catholic, and what I'm interested in in bridging that that uh, connection between the digital church and the local church in relationship to evangelization in the modern age with the younger generations. Yeah, the digital church is very interesting. I mean, you've got this... Um, you, you can you you already know what that people are suffering, right? I mean, even people that go to church are suffering. They they can acknowledge that, bring this to God, receive Holy Communion, receive the sacraments, right? Um, you know, with our evangelization on the digital front, the digital continent for a lot of our clients, what we what we realize is that there's a veil there that they really they they can actually like interface with faith without having to go to the church and feel uncomfortable. And so there's a bridge there that you can, you can, you know, yeah, using technology create. to yeah, create that. Um, but, it, but what the, the, the key, that, the, the, the point I'm trying to make, and this is the evangelical point is that people are suffering. They're suffering from addictions they're suffering from families that are broken. They're suffering from not understanding forgiveness and, and, and the freedom that comes from that. And, and somebody just walking them through that. I mean, you're talking about a lot of people, I mean, just now, just the, the people that suffer from the, uh, just sexual abuse, mental abuse, like this, th- this is unheard of, like in our culture, how many people are suffering from that? Having a digital interface to, to reach people and, and break a big barrier down is, is, uh, I think in the next hundred years. And, and again, like we, we might not be digital in a hundred years, we might be holographic or whatever it is. Right. But the church, like understanding that there's a veil there that we can can help people in within, right, and to bring them to church, not not to to just help them in, in that in that space and that alone, but but they're there and they're looking around and they're suffering and being able to bring Christ and the peace that comes from that and the life that comes from that. Um, it's not easy, but but at least you're 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 positioning that in a way that they understand and yeah. they feel comfortable walking along. You yeah, know. I Benedict called technology the great uh, digital Aragopagus, right? So, you know, in, in St. Paul's time, the Aragopagus is where everyone would go to uh, speak these new ideas, you know, in the Greek forums. And the Internet now, the church really has to make sure, and they haven't done a great job. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something that Fuzadi is trying to, <laughs> trying to help. Wrong side. <laughs> uh, I, was looking at the, I was looking at the camera, man. That's all right. Howard, don't do that to me. <laughs> so, no, um, you know, making sure that the church continues to really adopt and be on the forefront of technology and be lean and and understand technology and train its, its priests, you know, so that they know how to use digital communications and the latest cutting edge technology 
is so essential for the church to continue to grow and not fall further and further behind and more and more disconnected to people because that is where young people now and in the future are going to, um, that's where you're going to need to accommodate and them. And the opportunity is is amazing because like, whereas before technology, if you were behind in say building a church or reaching a community and providing a mission, you'd have to find a priest and then you'd have to find benefactors and build and things like that, which is all great. It's a need in the digital space. It's like all these tools are given to us. Like when you jump into it, if you jump into it properly, you're already advanced enough. Like you're, you're the innovation is very quickly sort of realized right. right in the digital space because of all the tools that are given to you. So that's a very technology is a very important part. I think in the next you know, hundred years. And especially if the capacity of technology continues to advance, you know, 200% every single year mm-hmm. that, that our ability of, of technological reach continues to build in that same trajectory. Yeah. I mean, the a hundred years looks very, very different. Very different. different. So it should, yeah. A hundred years different. from now, think about the last 20 years yeah. in all seriousness, yeah. you know, we're, we're getting close to 2020. Mm-hmm. Where were we at the year 2000? I had an Ericsson phone because I just started working and I could afford it. And I connected with my buddy Ryan Delacrosse and his text me the word <laughs> dot, you know, dot com. And I got these like digital texts and I was like, this is the coolest thing. Yeah. The word of God coming to me in a text message. But now through a yeah. hologram, you know, through through virtual reality, through augmented oh, reality, yeah. through mixed reality. Yeah. Where is the church in these spaces? And, you know, so often we'll go to a conference like the NAB conference in Vegas, the National Association for Broadcasters, or Microsoft Ignite, or Facebook, these different conferences that, that you know, leading technological infrastructure is being hosting. How often are, you know, we populating those as Catholic Church? Yeah. You know, on an organizational level, you know, having delegates from not only the USCCB, EWTN, or, or Spirit Juice, or any of these other, but like, seriously, like, diocesan representations and task forces to be able to know what's out there and how do we use it today? Yeah. Yeah. I'm making a prediction for in a hundred years. And I bet you there's already some guy out there who's already gotten this call and he's already in the works and eventually uh, his work will pay off. But I really do imagine in a hundred years, we will have a religious order like the Dominicans or Jesuits or the Franciscans whose only job is dealing in the digital space. Mm -hmm. Now I know we have a lot of religious orders like, the Daughters of St. Paul and other re- religious organizations who are very good at working in, in the digital space. But that's a thing that they're, because they're called to evangelism, have been doing. Right. But I really see a specific, like, dude, the Knights Templar of the internet, right, of digital communications where these, this religious order, these priests, these monks, whatever it is, that is specifically what they were trained and called or, to do. Yeah, or that, a bishop, that, that needs to happen. You know, like a bishop, like a, you know, a bishop of this of a digital space. And the reason why I say that is because, like, we we have a lot of ideas, and and we've we've generated a lot of those into apps, like Little Saint Adventures. We we generate vocations digitally for some of our clients. But one of the things that we recognize is that when we do vocations or when we want to build this platform to stimulate vocations and interest into it, because a lot of people are interested is that, you know, we need an Episcopal advisor yes. for that. Right? There needs We're to be not, a bishop of and, the internet. And this, right. th- this goes right to the place where I've prayed a lot about, as you guys know, I mean, I, I was studying for two years out in California, you know, got an MBA in executive production and spent time in this space, really investing not only my studies, but my prayer. And seeing that need is so aching. Like right now, we need to have that. Oh. And I looked at Bishop Barron, and I'm just waiting for Bishop Barron to be able to establish to be named the bishop of the internet. Absolutely. And and I think it's I think it's fitting. I think it's fitting because he gets criticized. He doesn't get criticized for a lot because the man is so immensely talented he's, and he's awesome. He's phenomenal. But. But the thing is, is like he's criticized because, oh, he's always all over the place. He's not at at his seat as a bishop and blah, 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 blah. We don't need him there. He is the bishop. Already he's the bishop of the interwebs in many different respects. So to allow that to take place so he can properly have a seat and manifest that in church structure and canon law, because we do need a missionary order. And I've dreamed of that order for a long time now because it's such an aching need today. So... Guys, I know personally that Pope Francis watches every episode of the Catholic Talk Show. 
He's one of our biggest supporters. He's I, a huge fan. I know what's happening. He's so, got nothing going on on Tuesdays. <laughs> so, Papa, Holy Father, consider making Bishop Barron the bishop of the internet. I, it would be a good move in your, in your. Uh, and, and we're speaking humbly. Right. We're speaking humbly. Yeah, it's just a recommendation. You know, call me. <laughs> you know, you got my number. Call me if you need any, you know, any insight in that. I'm happy to give. It. I, I do think it's it's so necessary yeah. though, and and it should be considered. Because sure. I mean, look, the sizes of like these digital audiences are bigger than most than mm-hmm. a lot of dioceses, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So, and when it comes to the teaching component and the passing down of the catechesis that's entrusted to us, th- there's no greater forum that we have in front of us to be able to produce and deliver on all of those ends. So we we talked about some of these kind of, um, I guess, ethnic parishes and how. Uh, you know, those were built in the early 1900s and how there's really not a need for them anymore. But a lot of those were built by missionaries coming from these countries. You had Irish missionaries. I mean, the Irish uh, priests that came to this country were instrumental in building the church in America. Oh, yeah. FBIs. Mm -hmm. Right, foreign-born Irish. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like in 100 years? Who are going to be those Irish priests in the year 2120? And now, if you look at statistics, I really believe that in 100 years— it's going to be the church in Africa that's supporting the church globally. Um, looking at the statistics, so in, in 1900, there was maybe two to three million Catholics in all of Africa. Um, right now, there's 200 million Catholics in Africa. So looking at those trends, if like you know people who look at uh, population trends and, and conversion trends, by the year 2040, there will be 460 million Catholics living in Africa. Now, for perspective, 460 million Catholics in the year 2040 would be more Catholics than there was in the entire world when the Vatican Second Vatican Council happened. Mm-hmm. That's how big that church is going and to grow to be. the Second Vatican mm-hmm. Council would happen in 1960. 1959 something. to 1962. So there was 460 million Catholics in the world in 19, 1960. Wow. And by the year 2040, there will be 460 million Catholics in Africa alone. Yeah. Africa is the future of the church. And those priests, and we're already starting to see this, like I'll go to like a remote parish in Pennsylvania and there'll be a priest from Africa. And he'd be like, that is their pastor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were in Pennsylvania. Remember that? And we yeah. saw, saw an African priest. And, mm-hmm. and it's true. We, we see that in our country, but even there's clearly, right? So the, the evangelization of Africa, for the most part, even in America, we're by the Irish, right. you know? So in relationship to that, it's so beautiful because the Irish missionaries that evangelized the various countries of Africa, now they're going back to Ireland and ministering to ministering in all those different churches, which I find so yeah. beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I really look forward to seeing a Pope from Africa. I yeah. would love to see that in my in my day, yeah, I, in my, I, I, in my I lifetime. For, yeah. I and I don't think it'd be unreasonable that the next Pope is from Africa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um I I think that would be actually really excellent for the church. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And in a previous episode, we talked about there's like a replica St. Peter's Basilica. That's right. The biggest in church Africa. in the world is actually in the church. Ivory Coast. Yeah. Yeah. That's, wow. It's cool. I believe, yeah, the heritage I believe of Ivory our Coast. faith there is just so rich. And, you know, some of my closest friends are from Nigeria and the, the heritage of their faith and their gifts are so impressive. I've learned so much. A big shout out goes to Father Bernadine and Father Peter Kenotiko. I know they listen to the show and, and just know of my love and my appreciation. So up until this point, we've kind of talked more, I guess, practical realities of the church in the future. But I think there's some darker things that we need to consider, and that is the way that society is going to treat the Catholic Church in the future. Um, Cardinal George famously said that he was going to die in his bed, that his successor would die in a prison, and then his success, that successor would die in the streets, basically saying that... Um, the persecution of the church is coming. I mean, our church. You mean it, in the U.S. because it's already happening really It's already happening all over the world. All over the all world. Over the world. Absolutely. Like, there's so much going on so, that's but, way worse but those than here. Are, a lot of that is in, in um, you know, Southeast Asia and the Middle East where the persecutions are based around war and historical religious differences. I'm talking, this is going to be straight up based on beliefs. I mean, in the United, uh, California is looking to pass a bill to make Catholic priests have to disclose the contents of confession. Mm -hmm. I mean, a priest is either going to be going to prison or getting excommunicated. These are the choices that the church is going to have to make in the future. I mean, when it comes to things like um, 
uh, same-sex marriage or adoption of uh, to providing adoption to uh, same-sex married couples or um, well, it's already happening. They're shutting yeah, they're down, shutting, shutting down, down Catholic charities. They're shutting down, you know, uh, organizations. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of lawsuits right now going on um, that protect or, or about protecting religious liberty. Uh, that ship has not sailed at this moment. But I think it's, it's a, tenuous. It's tenuous. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the biggest uh, concerns for the global church are the persecutions in in the Middle East, uh, even now in Africa. Um, I mean, there is there is abject hatred and and and, and bloodshed, bloodshed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Egypt, we we heard but about to that. never to never lose contact with the father's contribution in relationship to the insight of what martyrdom provides to the church and what does this bloodshed and persecution provide for the church? It is the very seedbed mm-hmm. of the church's evangelical growth, so that we become a faith community by the deposit of faith through these witnesses of these martyrs. When we, when I was studying church history and, and one of my professors posed the question and said, what do you think was the convincing argument for people to become Christian in those initial days of, you know, Rome and the persecutions under Nero and all that stuff? And, you know, a lot of people were throwing out different ideas. And he said, it was the witness of the men and women being led down the main street of Rome to their martyrdom. And all along that roadway, they were singing and clapping hands and praising God and filled with joy. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself was such a powerful witness that droves of men and women became Catholic because they had something that they wanted. And that is the expression of joy and the freedom that comes to us in the worship that we have contained in our faith. Yeah, I don't think the violent persecution is going to go away within 100 years. No. But I do think that the legislation, legislative persecution is going to ramp up to essentially where I could very easily foresee in 100 years, basically the church is going to have to go back to the catacombs because of legislation, because it will be, um, I don't know, a hate crime to be a Catholic. Mm-hmm. I can really easily see that happening. Yeah. Um, and that should that should terrify everyone. And that, like Ryan said, that ship has not sailed, but it it's it's trending towards that way. And and it's not a zero sum game. I mean, they're going to keep on putting these types of laws into effect into the point where it will essentially be illegal to. Act. You can be Catholic, but if you actually want to practice your faith, that's not going to fly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's a again like you can. You can project that, obviously, but it's already re- happening. It's it's happening, but you can project it towards its end, right? Right, which is ultimate persecution and catacombs. That, that's what you said. So you you have you have that. You can project that there, uh, but within there, you have this 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 miracle of the seed of Christianity being spread through martyrdom mm-hmm. and suffering mm-hmm. and the joy therein, um, and you you don't know where that where that's going to, and how that's going to affect the coming decades. That's, that's Providence. That's God's, you know, Holy will. That's uh, the Holy spirit. There's a whole lot of, yeah. And absolutely like the church, the church suffered through many different generations and you could see the growth suffering now that, that came out of that suffering. So the suffering of now, what does that look like in 20 years? What does that look like in 40 years? I am confident to say that it will actually sow seeds of great intimacy and union and solidarity and the fabrics of our faith. So I don't know if I share completely, like we're going to have to go into this kind of underground reality, the church. Is it possible? Most definitely it's possible. But, but at the same time, John Paul II, what he was facing in respect to um, Communism. communism, what he was, what he was experiencing firsthand at the hands of Nazism, you know, we could project and say, what if these political realities advance? That's a good point. But they didn't because yeah. people courageously and boldly stood up against it. Yeah. Our generation, the people who are learning these things, we're receiving the seeds of what John Paul II did. We're looking at, we're learning. We don't know. We're still young as a mm-hmm. generation. We're learning. 
our faith. We're learning how people are oppressed and are suffering, and we're trying to figure it all out. You know, a lot of the the generation, like the millennials, the younger the younger kids who are maybe not you know professedly so like I'm I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, I don't want any type of affiliation. They're still looking for right. Right. what we have. It's just not being shown to them. That's exactly right. So you know, we experience it because we live in it every single day. Somebody showed it. Showed it to me exactly. Right. Somebody that's showed why, it to me. That's why I am where I'm at. A- Amen, brother. Like think think of uh, yeah. we talk about Father Tetlow all the time. Yeah, he's 35 years a priest. Oh, I won't I won't tell his age on, on <laughs> air. But like you know, he's he's 35 years a priest, and he still has that mission alive in his heart. Yeah, and it's that mission that that opened me. I'm like, wow, man, this this yeah. way of life is beautiful. Yeah, every day I'm visiting the nursing homes. Every day I'm visiting the hospital. Every day I'm receiving people that are suffering. Every day I'm I'm empathic and loving and compassionate. And I want to just be present to people and speak words of prayer and and the word that comes to us in scripture that consoles. And I get to meet the widow, the orphan, the drug addict, the and this uh, is my whole life and mission. Dude, yeah. I'm down. Sign me up. I want to be a what, part of this yeah, way of life. What about the the core tenet of the faith, the one that brings you I, actually the, the 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 body of Christ, like consuming the body of Christ yes. and him living in you like this is this is like this this is the differentiator of all Christianity, yeah. and ninety percent don't even know it's there. Like, are you are you kidding me? Yeah, that's like that's, going to McDonald's and yeah. being like, I didn't even know you sold a Big Mac, man. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah. a, it's a, that's the equivalent. I think that's a really good point. Is that you know as time progresses and in a hundred years, uh, if you look at the trends of of mainstream Protestant branches, really the trends of the declining membership. I really see just uh, pragmatically that a lot of these churches are going to be reunified under the Catholic Church just out of necessity. I could really easily see the Church of England, and um, especially after breaking up with the the Russian Orthodox Church, but the Byzantine, uh, the the Greek Orthodox Church coming back into union, and mm-hmm. and the Lutherans. I could really see that because we are really close. With Man, them. I would love to see that. Oh, I, mean, I would love to see you that. know, particularly with the Anglicans, the Lutherans, and um, Constantinople. We are so theologically close. Now the only thing keeping us apart is historical differences mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, pride of, you know, place, right? Mm-hmm. But within a hundred years, out of necessity, I don't think we can, I think divided we would fall. And within a hundred years, if we're not together, it's going to be a problem. So I think mm-hmm. necessity will drive these churches back together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, a hundred years from now, when when uh, Pope uh, Francis the twelfth, I don't know how many posts we have by then, <laughs> well, Pope John Paul the fourth. <laughs> and he's having this big ecumenical council where he's bringing in the Church of England, the Lutherans, and Constantinople back to the church. Yeah. Yeah. You can say Ryan Shield predicted it 100 years ago. <laughs> in the catacombs, right. Well, we'll have the, t- the talk show then so because yeah, mm-hmm. of the cryogenic stuff. <laughs> right. you know? So we'll be around. You yep. guys should too. Right. All of you should be around for that. So that actually brings us into the last thing I want to talk about is what the impact of science and bioengineering um, and other technologies will have on the practical application of the faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are going to be living longer. There's going to be a lot of really intense life issues coming up around cloning. Like you think that the uh, the debate around abortion has been difficult. Uh, when you start getting into cloning and replicating human parts and people living for hundreds of years, I mean, that technology is coming. Oh, yeah. It's coming. Mm-hmm. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Mm-hmm. But the ethical dilemmas that that raised – and the opposition that the church is necessarily going to have to that is really going to place us uh, as a pebble in the shoe of the march yeah. of technology. And we're going to get stomped on it unless we really get that yeah. wrapped up now. It's, it's the same thing with AI, right? Like letting AI run loose, quantum quantum computing, and how you know machine learning will happen at such a rapid rate. And the reality is, is that scientifically, it's not, uh, we're not capable of it. But at the same time, like... Once it does happen, you know, anytime you try to, this is nature abhors a vacuum, right? Any try, anytime you try to control nature, uh, there's still the intent and the creator within, and there's still going to be some repercussions from that, right? There's just never a perfect way to control anything. It's, it's not the control is, is God himself, the creator Mm -hmm. himself. And so he is obviously smarter and wiser enough to, to understand the the impacts of a lot of things that we can do to control. So I, I think that, yeah, you do control it. You'll have this really 
biomedically you'll have this really like it's it's almost like botox or something you see somebody you're like dang you just mm -hmm. did that too many times you know it's kind of like that it, it's yeah. it's going to be something where you're just like oh dude this is not good mm -hmm. we should stop yeah but mm -hmm. i mean you're going to get in the year 2120 the catholic church i can only presume is going to be fighting uh genetic manipulation where they're creating yeah. human beings that are completely genetically um yep. customized based on the wishes of the parents and will there even be uh, children that are born of the natural process is probably pretty rare. Mm -hmm. That's weird. <sighs> That's and it's and, and, and it's, so it's here weird. already. I mean, it just you know, genetic yeah. manipulation in in the womb. And, and there's all so much good stuff that that can do mm -hmm. therapeutically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Genetic stem cells and different mm -hmm. things like that that have come out of a the lot properties. Of those, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, I was I was talking to a family um, and and this gentleman his his son has Down syndrome, and you know, like how many Down syndrome kids are we going to have a hundred years from now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'm what a sorry, tragedy. I'm, absolutely. And and well, I'm sorry. Are we gonna have I, a lot I would or none. Less I would prefer it would be close to none. Oh, okay, Iceland gotcha. Iceland has no um, children with Down syndrome because they abort 100 percent of them. Wow. So and it's terrible because if you've ever been around somebody oh gosh, with Down syndrome, they are 100 percent love, beautiful. unconditional love yeah. that is pouring out constantly in a constant manner to the good of the other, to the Spir good of oneself. Spiritually, I am jealous of them and how Absolutely. happy they are, and, and they're people amazing. Pour their what love a out gift to them. they are! What, and exactly, that's what I'm, I'm exactly. saying. Exactly, like, they, they, they merit it just by their nature alone. Yeah, what a tragedy! It that is, is that's one of the tragedy. very worst. And things that's happening that, now. Yeah, that is one of the worst things that happened in the world. Yeah. And in a hundred years, you're right. I mean, will any parent allow a child, you know, besides the underground Catholics living in the catacombs, mm -hmm. you know, one thing I know children with Down confidently syndrome. without a shadow of a doubt, a hundred years from now, that fiat voluntas tua is going to be said by the faithful. What is that? It is your, your will, will be, be done. done. Oh. Gotcha. It's the prayer of Jesus Christ. It's the prayer that brings us together in respect to whatever type of denomination. Yeah, we're not going to have the choice to do it on our own will because we're not going to have the power to do it anymore. Exactly. And that underscores what you were sharing before, Ryan Delacroix, is just the, the whole fact of God's will be done. Because before it, we either are broken before it mm. or we humble ourselves before it. And there are there will be a community that is still humble before the will of Almighty God because that is the gift of joy when we live in His will mm -hmm. and and we lay down ours. Yeah. So it's the year twenty one twenty, and Pope John Paul the Fourth is the Pope, and we're fighting all the modern uh, issues that the Catholic Church has. It's it's going to be pretty intense and pretty wild. And how is that going to turn out? Um, what what do you, what does the audience think? I'd like to well, hear what the audience thinks on this well, as well. Sure. We we always know that Christ is the victor. So Amen. I mean, how does it turn out? God wins in the end, and and there's a lot of destruction in in the wake of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is I mean, we we did an episode when we were talking about space exploration stuff. There's also going to be that. I mean, there's very good chance that in a hundred years there'll be some sort of colonization of either the moon or or we'll put Mars, our studio there. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dude, well, it's, our, dude, our it's expensive studio. enough to travel to Houston to record, you know? <laughs> uh, dude, I don't want to do that. My wife would be like, dude, you're going to be gone for six years? I'm like, I got like episodes to record, Kelly. I'm sorry. There's got to be some light phobe we can ride or something. <laughs> so if you're connecting with us on the end of webs and we're in a studio 100 years from now on the moon, wherever you connect, it's still going to be the same domain, www. CatholicTalkShow.com. Make sure you're subscribing on all of our platforms, connecting with us in social media, and most certainly we give a big shout out and thanks to all of our patrons on the Patreon app. So Patreon.com forward slash The Catholic Talk Show. We thank you so much for journeying with us, looking into the future of the church, and we want you to be a part of that future because collectively, as we join our hearts and our minds together, we continue to worship God, central to the Eucharist and the fabric of what Eucharist means to us as faithful men and women. We will continue to look forward to the future with courage and hope, confident in the fact that Christ is going to do remarkable things today, tomorrow, and forever. Now. Father, I see something in your future that you didn't see. What's that? That's an inquisition. Oh, I almost uh, got out of that oh, yeah, too. Yeah. I actually literally didn't see that coming. Yeah, I know you didn't. <laughs> you lack that foresight. Ooh, dang. All right. So this is a question that, okay, it's 100 years from now. And okay. by the graces of God and medical sciences, you're still rocking the priesthood. And, <laughs> and with arthritis in yeah. both knees and barely... <laughs> Moving around with my biceps. That was, last, that, was, that was last night. Oh, yeah, that was last night. So you're going to look like one of those dudes in the magazines <laughs> that take HGH. It's like old dude's head on a totally ripped body. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I, I think that definitely the cl cloning is coming. <clears throat> Um, and another thing that they're exploring that I eventually will get there is downloading the consciousness of somebody's brain activity into a new, absolutely new physical body. They made a movie about that yeah. with Johnny Depp. So, okay. Number one, do you baptize a clone? Mm. And then number two, if a person has their consciousness downloaded into an absolutely new body, does that new body get a new baptism? Mm. Wow. That's uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just hold gonna on, say to you, I feel on. sorry for hold that on, right Thank now. Hold you, on, bro. Ryan. Proceed, guys. You're killing me. Well, one, I would have to consult with John Paul the <laughs> Fourth <laughs> <laughs> and the moral theologians of that. Uh, well, this, that this is right after the pontificate of Ryan, who would be Paul the Sixth, the Second. That's right. That's right. Um, my inclination is, I, I hope to God. That we could we could stop that incubator and cloning of of humanity, um, you know, because it creates so many moral facets. You're stalling. And, well, I'm thinking. You're I'm stalling. Thinking, yeah, you're stalling. I mean, this is a tough. This is one of a, this is one of the more difficult ones. Um, so in the case where like consciousness has has transmitted to another body, um, consciously that baptism existentially would still be applicable to the person it makes an indelible mark on the yeah, soul. So it's, it's, it's the but soul. It's, but we're also so that beings. I can answer that I can answer a little bit more freely, freely and clearly yeah. than the, the, the body, the, the former, the former one, but a clone, I mean, does a clone have its own soul and does it need salvation? And how do you treat a clone? Mm -hmm. Is there a conception? I mean, isn't, doesn't the soul come in at conception? Is there, there's conception somewhere, right? Well, yeah. it's, it's, do you pass? I'm, I may have to. <laughs> I may. Padre needs a hundred years to think about I, this. I need, I need time to think about it. I'm squirming over here. Um, I, I mean, I think there would be parallels in how the church treated uh, babies who were made from in vitro. That's what I was thinking, in vitro. So, I mean, e even in cases like that, you know, like I granted the, the guidelines for the church is that it's communicated that the church does not stand in support of in vitro fertilization, but that's actually where my mind was, was moving. Um, so like the inclination is always toward mercy. The inclination is always yeah. toward salvation. So, and without ultimate knowledge of what this is, you're yeah. going to, and, and the church, go and thank God we have the moral compass of the church that yeah. be, that has the ability of communicating these are the philosophical problems that we're facing. This is why the church stands yep. in opposition to these realities. But the church is always there as a mother to draw, to educate, to cleanse, to to inspire, to be able to, you know, um, to offer that salvation and a home. Well, so why don't we just leave it to... Those doors are always open. The doors of mercy are always open, you know, when, they, when they're when they open in the heart of Christ. Well, so. why don't we just leave it to the Third Vatican Council to decide Thanks what to do to with God. Or the fifth. The, the Thanks, fifth Peter Vatican God. could be moving a little quicker. Vatican five. <laughs> right, let's just, we're going to have a leaner church. Remember? Right. <laughs> so less bishops to fly in. So yeah, in the year 2120, the fourth Vatican council can figure out what to do about cloning and downloading of consciousness and other bodies. Right. Well, that was a very, very difficult, difficult uh, uh, experience you, 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 there with you, the inquisition. You did good today. and you got time. Yeah. So, so what's in your future is the fact that you're going to go on catholictalkshow.com, visit us on the web, subscribe to us on all of the platforms and social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as journey with us and support the show. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash the Catholic Talk Show and make sure that you help us in that way financially so that this show and our community online will continue to prosper into the future.